In this episode, along with our three adventurers, we are about to meet a few interesting characters, such as this one who steals expensive earrings, and another one whose name is Douglas. Meet a man whose childhood dream has been fulfilled, and people who work compassionately in a bird and animal hospital. Have you ever asked yourself, how does the scarlet ibis get its red color? Why do birds stand on one leg? Did you know that they are birds whose bright red flight feathers are made of real copper? A parrot is the only bird that can transfer food from its foot to its mouth. Macaws have patterns around their eyes, each one unique like a fingerprint, and that they live from 80 to 100 years, or that lorikeets suck nectar out of flowers. And did you know that birds are social creatures and that birds have wings because they need to fly and should never be kept in cages. idea how many birds there were in the Garden of Eden? Well today at Birds of Eden we're going to have a small glimpse of what happened. I'm here with Charlene and she's going to take us inside. Charlene? Hello, yeah? please follow through. Let's go. Birds of Eden is the world's largest free flight aviary and bird sanctuary located near Plettenberg Bay in the Western Cape, South Africa. Its free flight capacity is larger than any individual free flight dome in the world, including the world famous Kuala Lumpur Bird Park in Malaysia and Yurong Bird Park in Singapore. Birds of Eden was started by Tony Bluchnert in December of 2005. Um, it's the same um, company as Monkeyland and created for the same reason, to uh, give a home to previously caged or pet birds. Um, all of our birds that are in Birds of Eden, and there's over 3,000 of them here representing 194 different species, are either expats confiscated by nature conservation because they were illegally caught. Um, for instance, our Neisner Luris that we've got here were originally um, confiscated because they were being illegally exported and this is now where they've come to live, live out their lives. In Birds of Eden we have an indigenous forest that um, forms 70% of the aviary. The aviary size is three hectares. So 70% of that is this indigenous forest that we see around us and, and that's what's made it possible for the birds to settle as nicely as they have because they're living this natural environment. Uh, we have um, a natural water source that runs through the bird park um, that goes through a natural lung that also gets filtered. Over 1.2 kilometers of walkways, of which about 75% are elevated, allow visitors to see the birds at all levels of the aviary. The bird inhabitants of the aviary are comprised of a mixture of exotic as well as African birds. What Andre is shooting over there, he's got a little purple on his back and a white belly. It's called the plum-coloured starling. That's also the male, once again, more beautiful than the female. The female is actually an olive brown. It's a very beautiful little starling, that wore from Central Africa. That's, that bird over there is a Buffoni green lurie. It comes more from Central and Eastern Africa. It's part of the Turacos. The Turacos are very unique in that they have those red flight feathers. It's actually made of copper. And um, it's a unique mineral compound called Turaca verdin and Turicin. No other animal in the animal kingdom contains copper. So these are unique and endemic to Africa. Yeah, very nice hairdo. And all of them are different. There's 24 different kinds of, of Turacos. In here, 10. 10 times. They don't all have the red flight feathers, but it's a unique family. A little bit smaller than the Nisna, it hasn't got the white crest. These are little Mayer's parrots. This is one of the few African parrots. We only have 15 parrots in Africa. They're becoming quite endangered now due to the pet trade. 
Very, very, very pretty, very small though. No, I wouldn't. I'll show you the ones you can. Those ones are uh, from Africa. From Africa, yeah. These little parrots are from Africa. This is a rock pigeon. Um, what makes a pigeon quite special compared to other birds is that they can actually suck water, whereas other birds pick the water up and tilt their head back. Only pigeons and doves that can suck water up like a straw. Okay, this is a little Indian ringneck parakeet. This is the little, this is a boy. You can see it's a boy in this species very easy because he's got the actual collar. The girls will just be green. They come in a lot of colours, but this is the original colour. But over the years, the breeders have played around and you get a yellow, you get a pink, you get a blue. But this is the real colour. Our birdies here are eating because the forest doesn't have enough food to sustain them. We have to feed the birds. Twice a day, they get fresh fruit and veg, a, a specialised mixture here of sunflower seeds which are sprouted. We don't serve dry sunflower seeds very bad. Cooked legumes, cooked millies, which is corn and then a special egg mixture, which we, we buy all of this. None of this comes to us free of charge. We pay the best for the best. So we feed them in early in the morning, now in the afternoon, five o'clock, everything comes out because they don't eat at night and also to prevent rodents and just for sanitation purposes. It's sort of sprouted like that. Why you serve it like that is because dry sunflower seeds have got a very high fat content. When, you, when it sprouts like this, it changes the whole fat um, soluble mixture altogether. If you serve it dry, you actually halve their life. This is a little cockatiel. Oh, yeah. This is Holly. Holly came to us about five weeks ago and Holly didn't have any feathers here on her chest. Her feathers have all grown out and she's in here already in five weeks, which is quite quick. Little. Do you know what happened to her? Um, no bird should be in a cage. Holly was probably very stressed and all birds need to breed. So during breeding season, they become worse. They start pulling out their own feathers because it's, it's hormonal. But no bird should be in any cage under any circumstances. If somebody would approach me to, be, to get a bird as a pet, I'd say absolutely not. It's not an ideal pet. Only ideal pet is a cat or a dog. Birds are very sociable creatures. They need friends, they need entertainment, they need to be stimulated, and they need to fly. That, why else do they have these wings? Why people would want to cut their wings, I have no idea. I think it's awful. No bird should be in a cage, ever. So what if, if someone like has, well, not like that, but you know, some people are really crazy about birds, and they kind of have really huge cages where they can fly and have like you know, five or uh, six parakeets or whatever. If you can provide them with a decent home like that, then I, I would agree, yes. If you provide them with the correct food and a, and a flight area where they can actually fly, that's what we're trying to encourage other people to do now. So in that circumstance, yes, I would agree. A choir was singing at the amphitheater inside the aviary when a parrot flew down from a tree and sat nearby. After the song had started, he flew over and perched atop a choir member's shoulder. that we were expecting was to have competition from this little person and he just came down from the trees when we started singing decided to sit on my shoulder and uh, I was a little bit worried that he was going to nip me or steal my earrings or pull my teeth out or something and he seems completely and utterly fascinated by what we're doing and it's a real privilege to actually be in a, in a position like this and have a wild animal react so beautifully. This is a Ferrari. He's yellow. She's orange. Thank you, Gamer. Thanks. Moustache parakeet comes from Sri Lanka, Pakistan kind of area. Very pretty. 
but you can see the stripe over his nose, which makes him a moustached parakeet. Parakeet just means medium-sized parrot. No real interchange. What makes a parrot a parrot, though, is the fact that a parrot can actually take, pick up food and transfer it to his mouth. No other bird can do that. With, with, the with his foot. foot. You'll see an owl will hold his food and he'll take his head down mm -hmm. to, to rip. But a parrot can actually transfer, he plays like that. Yeah. That's what makes parrots so unique, is that they can actually transfer their food to their mouth and their toys. This big bird here, yeah. this is a blue and gold macaw. What, the, one of the biggest flying parrots. What makes a macaw so unique is the, the individual's uh, facial hairs here. If you have a look there, he's got all different patterns around his eye. It's unique, like a fingerprint. So each macaw is different. They're incredibly strong. If, if he did happen to bite your finger, he would bite right through bone and all, no problem. In the wild, they eat macadamia nuts, they crush things. So very, very strong. They get to a good age between 80 and 100 years. We've got one in here that's 42. So this is not something you would want sitting in a cage in a kitchen. Because it's going to outlive you and it's going to be passed from person to person. The other one over there. Yeah, there's his friend. <laughs> yeah! You're a noisy Dad. boy! This is a little rainbow lorikeet from Australia. What makes these lorikeets very special, they, don't, they have a brush-like tongue with a feather shaped like in a V or in a U, which they actually use, they, they suck nectar and pollen out of flowers. So in here, we have to supplement their diet. So they don't eat just that food. We make a special lorikeet nectar for them, which they love. They actually even bath in it sometimes and they get all sticky. He's very cute. Too. Yeah. This is a baby that I actually raised myself. Okay, these beautiful red birds are scarlet ibis. These are the national birds of Trinidad and the sacred bird of Japan. They're actually born a grey. They, they're grey with a little white tummy. And then you can see over there, he's still changing. It takes two years to get this full red plumage. Adult plumage. It comes from what they eat. In the wild, they would live in swamps and lagoons where they would eat red crabs, um, all sorts of invertebrates which have got carotenoids, which is an algae found in the water. Same as a flamingo. So without this, they won't turn red. So we've got to supplement their diet here. A lot of these birds are standing on one leg. All birds stand on one leg. Why they do that is because there's no feathers on their legs. So their legs are cold, they'll tuck it up, it will warm under their, under their body, then they'll alternate. They do the same thing with their beak. When they sleep, they turn their heads around and they tuck their beak into their back. This is Zamat. Zamat is a lesser sulfur crested cockatoo from Indonesia. This is the one we warn all our guests for, just for this guy, because he steals earrings like this. Yesterday he stole a black pearl earring, which is worth about 5,000 rand, and lying somewhere in the stand. Ich habe keine Ahnung, wie viele Vögel es im Garten Eden gab, als Gott die Erde geschaffen hat. Aber ich fühle mich hier ein kleines bisschen wie im Garten Eden, so wie ich es mir vorstelle, mit dieser Vielzahl von Vögeln, mit dieser bunten Vielfalt, mit den Geräuschen, die ich hier höre, einfach großartig. Our next stop, World of Birds. Now here, there's over 3,000 birds, small animals, and monkeys. So come on, let's take a look. Yeah, the start of the World of Birds is not an easy one to explain. It really started off when I was a very small child, and I was only interested in birds and animals and in nature. And all the dreams I had when I went to sleep at night was in my vision that one day I would be in India or in Africa, somewhere in the tropics. I needed to be where the sun was and where it is warm. And I would, have an, I would live in a jungle and there would be a little cottage in the jungle and all my animal friends were living with me because all doors and windows were open. So it was really a, a fantasy that was in my mind and that uh, in the depths of it never left me. Now, 40 years later, Walter is here as the owner of the World of Birds in Hart Bay near Cape Town, South Africa. With over 3,000 birds and small animals representing 450 species from around the world, this bird park is a big tourist attraction. Now, when I started, I had no money whatsoever. I didn't even have a car, so I hitched from home to Hart Bay every day. So it's, it's a long and a tragic history. But when you look at it now, being the owner of the world of birds with eight acres and from the childhood dream fulfilled, living in a tropical forest, surrounded by animals, yes, there was obviously a purpose that had to be fulfilled. 
If people ask me now, would you do it again? The answer is clearly no. But fortunately, we never know what the future brings, so we just have to follow a, a, the vision. But where I am now, I'm content. I'm a very fortunate. I'm one in a million. I am a person who has a childhood dream fulfilled. I wouldn't swap with anybody else in the world. And do now to be in a tropical forest that had been created from nothing, surrounded by flamingos, 60 of them, and vultures, and eagles, and owls, and pelicans, and parrots, and monkeys, and porcupines, and llamas, and bockies. Now, what more could I wish? for the rest of my life. It's been difficult. It's been difficult ever since. I've been working, uh, counting on superior guidance. And there have been many, many times when I said, look, I'll do the work, dear God, but you provide the means. After all, the project was inspired. It was given to me. It had to be fulfilled. Here I'm doing the work every day when my office, my office work finishes at lunchtime. I'm the happiest person to take a spade and the wheelbarrow and keep on creating with rocks, with plants, to make it a little bit more beautiful and better every day. But if it had not been for the miracles throughout that period, I mean, one of the biggest miracles was when we owed the bank three million rands. And we have been at the point of closing many, many, many times. And then somebody died and left us three million rands. If I did not believe in spiritual guidance, in a God-given purpose, in miracles given from above, so then I would, be, I would be very foolish. So we have a no-kill policy. So if an animal is so badly damaged <coughs> that it has to be put down, we will put it down. But if there is quality of life, we look after it, we care for it. And now we have six people full-time employed in our bird hospital, bird and animal hospital, in the incubator room, baby room. Not only to look after our own animals, but we get up to 200 birds and animals every month that people bring from the outside that we accept and care for them. Whether the animal has any value or not, whether it's a sparrow or an eagle, a starling or a parrot, we care. Um, we're just preparing food for our baby marabou stalks and our pelicans and little Bengal eagle owl baby. Yeah, they eat three times a day. Um, yeah, he should be eating on his own, but he's a little piggy. He's too forward and he doesn't get anywhere. Are you done? You're pretending to be starving. Make us look like bad mothers, you. <laughs> Chompers. Open up. Show my ugly mouth is. He's vicious. Okay, this is the oldest one of our marabou stalks. He is a week old. They also start eating on their own from day one to a degree, but you also have to assist them a little bit because they eat anything that, yeah, bowls. Also not the prettiest babies on earth, but they've got such sweet personality. Okay, he's actually eating really nicely for a change. It's normally like on his back and on his head. Pelicans as well, I mean, they're both pretty valuable and something so little when they hatch, they're so tiny and vulnerable um, that it's quite a, I'd say a really responsible thing to, to have to do. Wait, a little beast. This owl is, how old are you? Four days old. And they, on the other hand, are completely different to the, the storks and the pelicans. They're completely blind. Their eyes are still closed up until um, probably about a week old. Their eyes actually open, but they're blind up until about three weeks to a month. They, they can't see anything, um, sometimes even longer than that. Um, and then they don't, they've got no feeding response at all, apart from, like, if you touch their beak, obviously they can't see. Um, so that's the only way they can actually realize that there's food coming. Uh, this is normally over really quickly. So. <laughs> yeah, we're very wobbly. Working with nature and with animals 
you come closer to God than you would ever be in a church. This is my cathedral. So this is where I have, have found my peace, my way with God. I have a loving family. I have small children. What else, what else could a person want? I'm now 73 years old. I need to work at least another 20 years because there's so much work to be done. But to work with nature, to create like this, is exciting. Every day is fulfilling. I go to bed at night and I visualize what I have contributed on that particular day. And then it's easy to go to sleep. This is a very, very rich life. It's a wonderful life. And when you think of all the millions of people who have come, come through the world of birds from all over the world, the 45 people who are employed here, the people who had been employed coming and going, making friends, meeting girlfriends, getting married, having children. When you think of that spiral that the world of birds has created through me having been born during Hitler's time in Germany, then you wonder the, about the purpose of life, the miracle of life, what the universe has in store for each one of us. I'm truly inspired by the way these people care for God's winged creatures. I feel a new sense of respect for them and for these beautiful birds. I feel that I'd like to go and help create awareness of the challenges that birds face and how to improve conditions for them. When I walk among these birds, I think back to the Garden of Eden, when God put birds in flight for the first time, and what it would be like to see huge flocks of flying birds in the new earth one day. Being here among them at Birds of Eden and the world of birds has been amazing. I come from a part of the world where there are so many beautiful birds. I think there is a strong message here for us to help preserve a good environment for birds on this earth. They are also a good example to us of how many different species can live together in peace. Imagine bringing together a world of different birds, of different colors, of different sizes, and of different noises. A good example, the birds behind me. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope our program brought a little more color and a little more sound into your life. Until next week, God bless.